It's a great pleasure to have a conversation today with two friends of the Muse concert series here at the University of Hong Kong, Ed Dusenbeer and Harumi Rhodes from the Takash String Quartet. Hello, it's so nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice to see you. I think you were here, wow, must be about almost a year ago, uh, one of our very last concerts actually here in Hong Kong before both protests and pandemic kind of stopped the programming here. Um, but you did a wonderful uh, series of concerts, the Complete Bartok Quartet. So they were really great. And since that time, of course, a lot has changed for you. You've actually changed your viola player. Richard O'Neill has joined you. What has that been like? Yeah, I mean, Richard is a, a wonderful player that we've both known, we've all known for quite a long time. He's been a colleague of ours at the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara on the faculty. And, and Harumi's actually known him and played with him for longer than that. Yeah, Richard and I, uh, we overlapped in school together. We went to several um, summer music festivals together and, and various tours um, in our sort of uh, first stages of young professional life outside of school and um, have kept in touch ever since. And Richard's, Richard's the best, he's fantastic. So we, but, it, but things got off to a slightly different start than we had expected, of course, because of the pandemic. So uh, one day in June, there was a knock on our front door and there Richard was outside with all his luggage in his car. He'd just driven out from California and he actually stayed with us for two weeks um, during our first rehearsal period. So that was really nice, actually. We, we you know, obviously spent a lot of time just having food and socializing as well as playing quartets together. Well, you got to know him well. I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. I know him a little bit. He's very loquacious. He can talk a lot about music. I remember talking uh, about all the Beethoven quartets with him, and he seems to know every single note. I mean, not, not just on the viola. I mean, he seems to know every single note. So what is, what is it like in rehearsal then with, with, with someone like that? Does it actually change the dynamic of the quartet? I mean, how do you now work in decision making and all that? Well, I mean, as you were saying, Richard is, he has this wealth of knowledge, um, which is connected to the brilliant viola playing, but it's also separate from that. Um, he's somebody who's curious about everything and, and open and listening and um, constantly wants to know more. And that kind of attitude is very contagious and in a good way um, in rehearsal. And so we spend a lot of time talking about details, but on the other hand, we spend quite a bit of time now um, talking about big picture stuff, whether it's um, other repertoire that we're making connections with, with the piece that we're working on, or I feel like we're having discussions that are, um, uh, slightly different because we have, like you said, a different voice in the mix and, and that has a, a beautiful influence on the shape of our discussions. So what's, what are the projects to come? Because I can imagine that during this time you can't be performing live, right, on stage. So what's the plan now with this new quartet set up? What, what are you doing? Well, we've got um, some really nice video projects that we're doing for are uh, presenters in the in the US. So uh, one of those is a kind of a medley of movements, just a one hour program that we'll introduce. And then we're doing a longer program um, for the Library of Congress, which includes Mozart's 421 and um, Beethoven Opus 132. And we are doing a little bit of live streaming as well um, for our series here at the university. Um, they're, they're putting it out as a live stream and then also capturing it so it can stay up for people to look at for a few days. I mean, doing these videos, it's actually quite a good idea, really, because you are also making a kind of document of yourselves, right? But at a, I, I take it it's the same kind of quality that as, would, as, you know, in any recording, is that right? So that you would get that out there um, for, for the wider public in the end. Yeah, I mean, from our point of view, it feels very much like a concert in the sort of the attitude of how we treat the program and how we treat the, um, the conversation between the works. Uh, it feels very different in another sense because we miss, we miss our audience and we miss our, you know, that chemistry and that, that feeling and, and that the feeling of, of immediate sharing um, with 
human beings in the same room, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, but in terms of our own internal attitude as a quartet, we absolutely treat it like a concert, even though it's a recording. And the both the D minor Mozart quartet and the A minor quartet that you're you know, obviously playing uh, seem to be very um, well, you know, dramatic, gloomy, you know, minor <laughs> key works. I mean, it was that chosen for this time, or it was just an accident? It, it, it was just an accident. Um, I mean, this repertoire was picked uh, two years ago, uh, at least for that program. The, the the medley program that we'll maybe talk about a bit later that that actually was more specific to the time. But certainly going back to Opus 132, um, I'm really struck this time how, I, I guess the sense of fracture in the piece and the just the extremity of the contrast and the just weird juxtapositions. Um, when we first played it, we did actually play a live concert in Aspen um, where we played that piece. And that was the first time we played live. It was the first time we had a concert with Richard. And uh, it was quite cathartic playing that, I thought, just because the somehow we were in this period of such, and still remain in this period of such uncertainty and chaos. And I found myself sort of sinking into the more chaotic moments into the, in that piece with maybe greater abandon than usual. I think if it was, then the same with the Mozart, if, if both of these pieces were, you know, cover to cover, just dark and, and, and horribly gloomy, that would be one thing. But both works in very different ways uh, are, it's just so much more complicated than that. And there is something about that that's so attractive right now because gosh, we can really relate to that complexity right now. <laughs> you know, that feeling of, of being completely desperate and lonely, but also being full of hope um, or, you know, and fill in the blanks, these ideas of contradictions. If, if there's ever a time where I felt like I could relate to those sort of mixed feelings about about the world, I, I would say now would be the time. <laughs> yeah, these pieces are perfect. I mean, for the, for this time, I have to say, and you know, they, they are, as you say, really complicated in terms of their emotional journey. And I can imagine. I mean, the 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 base of the Hadigadankazan, right? The that incredible slow movement would be very uplifting, but through. You know, the suffering that we're going through. So it's like Beethoven knows something about what's happening right now almost when the music speaks. And the same with the Mozart. I mean, it begins very dark and it, it kind of remains dark in many ways. But there, there are these moments that seem to transcend, right? And music always does that. So I think it's perfect kind of setting. Of course, the other thing about the Beethoven is that it's also very normal, right? There's a march and a kind of minuet, the second and the a fourth movements. And it's like the new normal because it seems totally normal, but it's at the same time totally abnormal because it does really funny things to the rhythm. So it's almost an acknowledgement uh, that, yeah, you might want to go back to normal, but there's no such thing. And we can just pretend yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's funny that you, you mentioned the second movement of Beethoven because I was just thinking about that, and I know you, you write wonderfully about it in your book uh, about the complicated rhythms and how if you tried to dance to that, you'd, you'd fall over. Um, and today when we were rehearsing it, for the first time, maybe it's just partly with Richard and Harumi in the middle of the group, I had more of a sense of there being a, a, a light humor in that uh, opening than I've ever felt before. And I wonder if that's partly that I felt the need for the relief of that more than sometimes after that we just played the first movement and, you know, you feel particularly sort of 
stretched out on a on a rack a little bit by the end of that movement and um i've always struggled actually with the second movement the the main section how to make sense of it character wise and it it it's not a scherzo but i i found it lighter today for the first time mm. and you certainly need that at this time right at the moment i i think that beethoven there is a smile it must be a smile behind beethoven at that time because he's doing some funny stuff actually uh, to the music as well um i was thinking also in in the states i mean in in a way you you like in hong kong you know, you're facing the pandemic and also protests and there have been many issues that have been bubbling uh in, in the social fabric of uh uh, the United States for a while, and gender and race being really important issues. So I was wondering, Harumi, whether uh, the quartet has responded in any way to some of these issues that are really at the forefront of consciousness now in the States. Yes, I, I mean, it's something that can't be ignored. I mean, you know, I feel like this is a time, sort of the, the, the convergence of crises that are happening right now, it's, uh, it's a recipe for first and foremost reflection. Uh, and for me, that's been the key first step. I feel like um, I've had time to, to, to think about why I do certain things and why I don't and what I've learned in the past and how I can relearn those things if needed. Um, but specific to music making, I think on one hand, I'm of two minds of it. On one hand, I feel like this is the time that we should all stop everything and amplify uh, voices that haven't been heard. And another part of me feels like, let's have a period of learning and listening and try to make sense of re- distributing our priorities so that we can thoughtfully have conversations about how we can have sustainable, meaning, meaningful programming in the future. And I think both are important. I think immediate action is really important and immediate acknowledgement. A way to sustain um, thoughtful programming is, is also very important. And I think that's those are some discussions we've had in the quartet. And I've certainly done a lot of listening over the summer and um, some of our programming, even as early as this fall has reflected some of those choices. So, um, so yeah, we're definitely um, thinking about uh, how we can respond to the times. So what are those choices that you, you are sort of putting in as it were, the program? Uh, well, um, in the most immediate future, as in like right now, two works that we were working on are um, in this medley program that we were just discussing of movements. Um, the Five Fantasy Stuck by Samuel College Taylor. Um, and uh, we're also featuring a uh, slow movement from the Florence Price String Quartet Number no. 2 in A minor, a beautiful, beautiful slow movement, soulful music. Um, right. And so, uh, so those are immediately making it into um, some of our programming in, in September and October. Mm. I, mean, right. I think they're, they're both great pieces, but I, I noticed something in myself when we first started reading the Samuel Coleridge Taylor, that it, it, there's this urge to always want to put things into a context which one knows. So it, it, it's easy to sort of say, oh, this reminds me of that, that two against three there, that could be Brahms or, you know, this, this scared, so it could be Vorjak and it's, it's it's an it's an instinct, but in some way it's a little bit I'm a little bit embarrassed by it because really you need to move past that and start finding where the unique voice is. And and also it's not a one way street. I mean, especially in the case of Vorjak, um, you know, we know he was very interested by African American music when he came to America. And so it's it's not a, a one way thing. So I'm, I'm finding that very interesting. As, as Harumi said, it's really pause for reflection. And in the case of the Florence Price, when we first played it, um, I was thinking in a little, it was a little bit derivative, you know, sort of comparing it to certain things. And then we rested it for a while. And this time it's been really nice to come back to it and just feel this is Florence Price. You know, this is a piece we've, it's sunk in a little bit now and we're we're, 
uh, evaluating it on its own terms and maybe that's part of the longer process rather than just rushing to program things you've got to let them internalize so that you can try and give uh, give it as much an authentic voice as you can right i think also i think also with the uh, samuel coach taylor these five fantasy stuka when we found them i mean they're they're such colorful short character pieces strung together and and um there was i think there was part of me that was so happy to find these pieces mostly because i just love that genre the idea of um these little musical gems these musical vignettes that are so uh famous in solo piano music for example um and as a string quartet player i have no complaints i mean let's be let's be frank here i mean i have the uh most beautiful repertoire uh that i can and imagine um but we're not when you think of string quartet music you think of these monumental works you know you think of 20 30 40 45 sometimes 50 minute pieces that are um these masterworks in the repertoire and you know part of me is very attracted to the idea of finding these character pieces for string quartet and there isn't that much music like that um and it feel fills a void it fills and fills a need and a and and a love that i have a soft spot that i have in 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 this genre um and so that's also been very fulfilling um learning these these pieces i should just mention i mean just for, for listeners that uh, uh college taylor is not the poet uh <laughs> samuel taylor coleridge uh but uh uh, actually, a very well-known uh, black composer uh, from uh, the Britain uh, at, in the late 19th century, 20th century, and also very well received uh, in the U.S. Actually, um, and he, unfortunately, like many composers, has a short life. But he actually composed amazing pieces and was very well recognized. Uh, another composer like that uh, is, is Amy Beach, which, which is extremely famous drink and lifetime in, in, in America, so almost the same period. Uh, and you've just released um, a CD with uh, both the Amy Beach Quintet and the Elgar Quintet. I mean, that's a nice example of that kind of programming where you want to put something that uh, is maybe needs to be brought back to life, as it were. And well, the Elgar's Quintet is not exactly well known, but also, but Elgar is pretty canonic these days. So bringing these two together, it's a very nice pairing. Is that the kind of thinking behind doing something like that? Yes, I mean, when it comes to Elgar, I, I would like to try and disassociate him from Englishness. I feel like he's so smothered by concepts of English identity that I, I'm not tremendously fond of. And, and one understands it with certain types of music that he wrote, Land of Hope and Glory, and of course, Nimrod, all this thing, they, they're, they're associated with the English countryside and nostalgia and blah, blah, blah. But I find the piano quintet a very interesting, um, troubled work full of different styles of music. And I think it was criticized by people didn't really like it so much. They, they loved the second movement because they could write, that was a sort of Elgarian voice of Nimrod variation or the, of the a slow movement from one of the symphonies. But the different styles in the first movement, I think a lot of critics sort of say, well, he just patched together some stuff and it doesn't really work. But I think it's much more interesting than that. Um, and it's very conscious, the tension between different styles and so when we were thinking about what to do with the Elgar, I was very keen not to do another English piece. I didn't want it to be an English disc. Um, and I'd been aware of Amy Beach's music uh, and of the piano quintet. I hadn't played it at that point, but I, I was pleased to see that it was written, I think within a decade, it's a little bit earlier than Elgar's, but certainly within the time frame. And I just thought it would make a very interesting conversation between those two pieces. I mean, Harumi has much more experience actually with the piece than I do. Well, I mean, I, I love I love the Amy Beach Piano Quintet. I think it's um, it every time I hear it or play it, I'm always struck by. I, mean, I, I actually really feel like she takes out a magic wand in the first bar 
and puts a spell on all of her listeners. I mean, it really has that kind of once upon a time uh, fairy tale feeling. And I almost feel intoxicated by the harmonies and by her beautiful sort of sound painting that she does um, right away in the opening of the first movement. And um, in that particular way, I'm not sure I can really think of anyone who does it quite like that. Uh, and then the whole story unfolds. And actually, even though the whole piece is very emotional and goes through um, all sorts of transformations, it's actually not that long. And she, she's brilliant at being concise and, and her compositional techniques are, are fantastic. So it's this beautiful combination of lush romanticism, but also exceptional compositional skill. Her, her, her writing is, is um, masterful. I think it was Dvorak that said that uh, women could not be composers because they were unable. I <laughs> didn't have the technical ability to do that. But I think Amy Beach was one of, really one of the pioneers, and, and she was very conscious of that, uh, of being a woman composer and showing men that actually women also have exactly the same type of technique, in fact, even better in many ways. And what it strikes me about that piece is that despite that concision and all that technique that, you know, that's structuring the piece, there's an extraordinary lyricism, right, that comes through the whole thing. It's so beautiful. But to go back to the Elgar, I mean, it's, I, mean I think Elgar is one of the greatest composers ever, and his Britishness has not helped him. I and mean, that, that trope of him being a British composer, because, you know, nothing good ever comes out of Britain, right, in terms of <laughs> composers. That's the usual <laughs> uh, trope that goes around, because... You know, we used to, in, in, in the UK, I mean, basically in London, we just imported, you know, Handel, imported all these composers. They came in, Clementi, they performed, and then they went back, you know. Um, and so uh, we didn't really, not really until Elgar was just kind of a renaissance of, of you know, British composing. But it hasn't helped Elgar because he's always seen as a little slightly marginalized. And even in Britain, actually, he, he was Catholic. He wasn't actually a Protestant. So he was also somewhat marginalized. So I think we also listen to his music uh, in that sort of weird British way, which is really, really unhelpful when it comes to listening to works like the Quintet. But actually, there are a lot of other pieces out there that are terrific, really terrific. So I think that disc, uh, that, that, that program that you've done is amazing. I think it's brilliant. Uh, do, will you be doing that for concerts? Do you find that uh, it's hard to put on that kind of a concert and people will come or promoters will want it? Because I remember we had the Szymanowski Quartet come and they said, oh, we have two programs. One is this, and the other one has this work by Blakowicz, which is a quintet uh, written by a woman composer from Poland in the 1950s. And we said, let's, let's have that. And they said, what? <laughs> really? Are you choosing this? Nobody chooses this. But I said, yeah, we can do this at Hong Kong U. But uh, I, I'm not sure whether promoters and concert uh, audiences are, are always willing to come to these types of concerts. What's your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that's also, that's something we've talked a lot about. It's, it's also a little bit what promoters might want to hear from the Tokash Quartet versus yes. what they might want to hear from a really fun summer festival. And, uh, and I'm sort of hoping that now we've actually recorded the Amy Beach that we might get more invitations to play it because certainly it was tough going what we wanted to play it a few times before the recording and we proposed it and I think only maybe two places in America took it and then we played it in the Wigmore Hall with the Elgar um so yeah I I I'd definitely love to do it again and maybe the CD will help with this but it ties to the bigger question a, a little bit that if people are expecting that the Tokash Quartet play one sort of repertoire it might be broad it might be Beethoven Bartok Schubert's you name it but it's sort of up to us to introduce other things so that then presenters um, are not just thinking about those things when they book us I, I think it's also um, I think it's also part of my interest in being in a in a group that you know people are paying attention to what we're programming and people look to us for um, for what it is that we are put, putting out there. And so I think it's nice sometimes to change the conversation. In other words, maybe the question isn't, um, you know, well, what are you programming that's by female composers? Or what are you programming that 
um, is written by a black composer? Or what, you know, what kind of program can you give me that, that, that takes care of that goal? But maybe the question is, how can we uh, have these, this fantastically diverse and rich conversation in our programming period? And how can we do that without even talking about having all this or all that, or give me this or give me that, or we need that, or we don't need that, but rather to have a, uh, a really healthy conversation of works mm -hmm. in our programming. And I think that's something, um, I mean, I've only been in the Takash Quartet for two years. And so I feel like I have some perspective as an outsider and as an insider. And I feel like that's something that the Takash Quartet has always done beautifully, is programming in ways that show conversations and connectivity between composers and between audiences and performers. And it has that kind of interesting dialogue. And that's something that I think we're interested in continuing, um, especially uh, with some of the things that we've been reflecting on recently. And I think what is really wonderful about your programming is that, you know, normally quartets, yes, they do that standard Beethoven, Schubert, Bartok repertoire, which is great. And then they do the really modern stuff, right? Then you'll have the kind of the ligety and so on. Right? That, that quartets tend to do that because it's, it's, to them, it's, you know, it's very, very cerebral and actually it's, it's very masculine. Um, but uh, what you're doing actually are discovering a lot of pieces that are actually in sort of the, the, the sort of late... 19th century, early 20th century, right? You bring that out, which is not actually normally in that repertory of what, what quartets nor, you know, normally, how they present their image, as it were. So I think it's wonderful that you're able to, as it were, just present these works as great music uh, for people to listen to. I think it's terrific. I think what, one of the things I've been thinking about recently has been um, just, again, this idea of connectivity, like one of the one of the pros of being in a quartet is that you're in your own little world. Like you're, you're your own boss. You don't have a conductor, or, you know, you don't have a CEO or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but on the other hand, you you can also be quite isolated. In other words, you might not have that much interaction with other string quartets, for example. Um, but right now I feel very connected to the, to other string quartets and to other, chamber music groups who are also grappling with the same questions. And when they're doing interesting programming and when we're, do, we're trying to um, dive into this, you know, mutual uh, time of, of growth and learning and reflection, I feel more connected um, to other groups. And even, even if they choose to do all this or all that or something super modern or something that maybe wouldn't suit us per se, I am so glad that they're doing it. Uh, we are uh, interdependent on each other and I feel like we're all in this together in, in, that, in, in that we're, um, we're all trying to, to expand the canon. Mm. We well, actually have a, a very good graduate quartet in residence here um, who came a year ago before, you know, the, the, the summer crises and um, that's a group I think three of them are, are half African American, one of them is half Argentinian, and they have very interesting repertoire ideas. And um, there was a, a program slot that opened up in the fall on our own series. We usually have a guest group come in, uh, usually a young professional group, but they weren't able to travel. And so we decided, we talked with a, the Ivalis Quartet and decided to come up with a joint program and uh, our repertoire interests are quite different, but um, we will start playing the, the Coleridge Taylor fantasy sticker. And then we just said, you've got the next 35 minutes, you know, just present what you like and, and we'll, they'll do it. And then we'll finish playing a, a Villa Lobos piece together at the end of the program. And, and that's the sort of thing that probably usually we invite our graduate quartet to come back and do a concert after they've graduated. But this is an unusual situation and it, it, it's, it feels really fun for us to do that kind of joint project with another quartet and particularly a, a, a group of people that we're very fond of and also have seen um, go through considerable emotional distress um, thinking about themselves in this country 
during this period. And I think um, it's, that's been educational for us. Because this is at the University of Colorado where you're based, and it's great that you're doing that. And it's great, actually, that you're showing what I would call a, you know, these forms of cultural leadership as influences in so many different ways, both in nurturing uh, new quartets and also, of course, in extending uh, the repertory in so many different ways. Maybe I'll end by asking uh, something about another composer that is actually very canonical, but actually marginalized in some way, which is Mendelssohn, uh, because he really suffered at the hands of Wagner, <laughs> who uh, accused him of all, all kinds of uh, anti-Semitic slurs, um, and often regarded as a, a slightly lightweight. But you've been looking also at his Opus 80 string quartet, and also thinking about um, his sister's w work, actually, another uh, pioneer in, in terms of uh, women composers, uh, Fanny Mendelssohn. And it, a very interesting pairing that you have with her quartet and also uh, with uh, Mendelssohn's last work, actually. Um, so is this is something you want to talk about because it seems like a very interesting pairing and also bringing out some, again, new ideas, new repertory uh, into the whole programming of quartet uh, concerts. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the disc that we're making is um, uh, Felix Mendelssohn, uh, Opus 13 and op Opus 80, and also, as you were saying, uh, Fanny Mendelssohn's String Quartet. And um, I mean, her her quartet, I, I, I love so much. It's, um, it's a real crowd pleaser. The last movement, I mean, when we've played it live, um, people are are so excited by the last movement and, and it's, um, uh, joyful and also extremely virtuosic first violin part mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and also just a very 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 beautiful uh, opening first movement um, and again uh, her music is something that would stand up beautifully on let's say an all women composer program but uh, also stands up equally beautiful in this juxtaposition especially because of some of the connections, especially with Opus 80. I don't know if you want to. I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're starting that disc with the Mendelssohn Opus 13, which uh, we think was, uh, I think it was written in the year that Beethoven died. And that's a kind of a homage from a young Mendelssohn to Beethoven. Uh, and then his Opus 80 was, I think, one of the last pieces he wrote and was a homage to his sister who had just died. Um, so that the, there are conversations there, and um, yeah, we the Fanny Mendelssohn is a it's just a really lively and contrasting piece, and I think it's also helped me in the Mendelssohn Opus 80 that he wrote in her memory. It, there's something more palpable and vivid about that memorial when you're also playing her music it's it's somewhat intangible but um the slow movement of the opus 80 i think when he's really thinking of her makes more sense to me now than it did before i knew her piece well this is just amazing intelligent um programming i think it's fantastic so you have to come back uh, to Hong Kong you <laughs> Yes, when we can, you will be invited back and to do all these wonderful uh, eye-opening, mind-opening programs, because I think that would be wonderful for our audiences here, and that's what we love doing here at the university. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful, really wonderful, to talk with you and to, for you to share your brilliant ideas. I think it's been a very inspiring time. So thank you very much, Harumi. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks thank so much. You. Thank, thank you. you.